remake, reboot, remaster. They seem to be the words that bring either hype or dread in the video game community, particularly the AAA gaming space. They are nothing new, but the overall releases seem to be ramping up with the remakes of Resident Evil, Call of Duty, and The Last of Us. However, where they don't seem to be expected is the adventure genre, the more story and puzzle experiences. Sure, there have been remasters of Grim Fandango, or the first two seasons of Telltale Sam and Max, but I haven't heard any news about full-fledged adventure game remakes. Then I heard of Sherlock Holmes The Awakened, released a few months ago. I reviewed it for a gaming website, even playing it alongside the original game. Though my written review was satisfactory, there was so much more I wanted to talk about. The differences between the two in terms of presentation, gameplay, story. So, with encouragement from some friends, I set out to make a video that will compare the original 2008 remaster, confusing I know, but I'll get to why that is, and the remake, with more in-depth analysis. And hopefully a few laughs. In terms of both iterations, Sherlock Holmes The Awakened is an original Sherlock Holmes mystery developed by Frogwares. These guys are THE Sherlock Holmes game developers, making original adventures for the character since the early 2000s, and they clearly have a passion for the character, and his creator, Arthur Conan Doyle. Impressive stature, strong gaze, I think this man deserves a knighthood. On that, we can agree. Both iterations focus on Sherlock Holmes and his colleague John Watson, investigating a string of disappearances worldwide. Their adventure leads to the confirmation of a cult that worships Cthulhu, who many will recognize as the monster from the story Call of Cthulhu, written by H.P. Lovecraft. Admittedly, this is an uncommon crossover. When you hear detectives and Cthulhu in a sentence, you would probably think of paranormal investigators such as John Constantine or Scooby-Doo. Yet, because the crossover is unusual, it is what makes it more appealing. I don't want to get too into the story because that will require spoilers. First, I want to compare their presentation and gameplay. First, let's talk about the original real quick. I say original, but I'm reviewing a remaster from 2008. The original came out in 2006, but that version isn't available digitally. Still, the 2008 version has quirks, which I will get into. First, some positives. For a game that came out for Windows XP, this runs really well on Windows 10. For me at least, there have been no crashes to speak of, or stuttering while trying to keep up with modern hardware. There are a few technical bugs and glitches, but they are not entirely game destroyed. I only encountered a couple that might be related, but that was on a second playthrough, and I'm saving that for the spoiler section. A few character designs still hold up, with Holmes and Watson being the prime example, since they resemble Jeremy Brett and David Burke. However, I have encountered reused character models for NPCs more than once on the same street. Maybe they're each other's siblings. I don't know. Voice acting is kind of a mixed bag. Though Holmes and Watson's voices don't have the same charm as their live-action counterparts, their performances do invoke their characteristics. However, there were awkward moments like this. But why in blazes are we breaking in? Ah, Holmes! It sounds like they were voicing two different lines and then, for some reason, the two recordings got mashed together. As for side characters, the other actors can either lend some great personality to the various NPCs you will meet, those that sticks their nose where it don't belong end up feeding the gators around these parts. Or make them sound comical. Any man will be the same and with less provocation. My servant has left in the middle of the night. Damned ungrateful after all I have done for him. He's supposed to be a jerk, but his voice gives the impression of a mild-tempered gentleman. The environments hold up in many respects, but also feel dated and unusual. Are those supposed to be stars or holes in the universe? There are some detailed areas and they are easy to maneuver through. It even has some great water effects. But not all. However, some areas feel unusually barren. The port is the most empty and there is no real reason. You may see a couple of ships pass by, but no one is working at the warehouses, no dock hands, nothing. Is there a union established that makes everyone take a mandatory week off? Oh, and the lighting. Most areas, especially nighttime, look 
too bright for the horror game it tries to be. There are only a couple of dark areas in the entire... Why is Watson a silhouette trying to haunt me? Not to mention, there are a couple of rooms where there are lights, but no real source. Knowing Cthulhu is in the game, it's probably dark magic. Overall, the original's presentation is not a disaster, it's just dated with a few quirks. The remake's presentation, however, feels like walking out of a dirty river into a clean ocean. The environment's use of weather effects, water, and even brightness is much more in line with the setting it is trying to convey. This looks like a gloomy and busy London neighborhood. This looks like a dirty but occupied pier with signs of Cthulhu's influence. Excuse me, sir? I don't think your axe can be used as a hammer. This New Orleans bayou looks like a proper cityscape and bayou, and this asylum looks like something out of a horror movie. However, this game does have a minor lighting issue of its own. Most times, the lighting is fine, and still conveys the atmosphere for each area well. Other times, a level will look too bright. You can adjust it, but there is no picture to compare brightness to when adjusting it, as other games let you do. The only reference is the borders of the setting screen. Each area contains stunning detail and beauty. And then there's the soundtrack and soundscape. The tracks are consistently subdued, with various strings, pianos, and vocals. Combined with the soundscape, each level's ambiance truly stands out from one another. There are a couple of outliers, but they're in spoiler territory. I haven't mentioned music for the original because there is a surprising lack of it. Most areas don't even have a theme, and a lot of music tracks and bites are reused. Baker Street doesn't even have its own piece until the end and it's the same theme as the main menu. Also, my favorite track in the game is a spoiler. The characters in the remake are very well crafted. Unlike the original and its okay models, fewer siblings from the streets, and the characters that serve plot purposes feel distinct. It helps in gameplay too, when observing and casing characters for their profiles. However, as you can see, their facial animations are nil with only a few instances where they changed throughout the game. Maybe everybody made this face and now they're stuck. And finally, the voice acting in the remake is more phenomenal than in the original. Every character's personality can be determined by voice alone, many bringing great power and distinction. So you see, Mr. Holmes, I am a coward. The logic seems inescapable. Yes. You, a surgeon by trade, would have been perfectly useless in that conflict. What? No. And how many men have you helped since? Ailments eased, troubles tended? No more than a handful. Truth be told, I have become somewhat of a recluse. As you can tell, Holmes is much younger and more blunt, while retaining intelligence and aloofness. While Watson is more open and empathetic, yet also a hardened and experienced medic. Also, this guy goes from a mild-tempered gentleman with impatient dialogue to an impatient jerk with unforgiving dialogue. And in the meantime, please teach your companion the art of brevity. Now, on to gameplay mechanics. The original game is a hybrid between first and third person views that you can switch to with a button. In first person, you walk around with the keyboard and click on objects with the mouse. In third person, you click where you want the character to move or objects to pick up. Both are fine, but I mostly used first person. You can move around the environment just fine in first person and highlight interactions with the spacebar. The only reason I'd switch to third person is to record funny moments with Watson. 
Besides the perspectives, you will also find clues through observation or a magnifying glass. Some hints can occasionally be examined with a tape measure, Holmes's forensic equipment, and puzzle solving. Any important documents, items, or research you find will be in your journal, along with a map that helps with fast traveling, and a tab that keeps track of conversations. In truth, the only standard tabs are items, documents, and the map. All the other two are for those who forget conversations. The puzzles are the standard for classic adventure games. Combining items in the item menu to use on the environment, or minigames. On a first playthrough, or for those who hate solving complex puzzles, the minigames can feel overwhelming to the point of consulting a guide. Still, there is only one point in my playthroughs where I consistently needed a guide, which I'm surprised even made it through playtesting. Most problems can be solved by consulting the journal for relevant documents, even ones obtained at the beginning of the game. Sometimes paying attention to the dialogue can solve puzzles, but this is rare. I'm saving the puzzles for the spoiler section, but just know there is a reason the adventure game genre is more relegated to the indie scene nowadays, or streamlined for casual play by most AAA developers. The puzzles themselves are a fun challenge, and highlight Holmes's intelligence. He is supposed to be smarter than the average person in all of his iterations. However, the clues and items are not hard to find, and the few that blend in with the environment can be highlighted with the tap of the spacebar. It feels less like an investigation and more like a puzzle game with crime-solving elements. In stark contrast, the remake is reminiscent of recent entries such as Crimes and Punishment and The Devil's Daughter. You go around gathering clues and logging them into a journal. Finding said clues can be done through careful observation of the environment or NPCs when constructing their profile. Other clues require concentration where Holmes uses a detective vision to perceive clues highlighted by the green symbol, and even reconstruct crime scenes where the Cthulhu symbols are present. Obtaining these clues helps to better question suspects or even confront them to get more information. Then there's the Mind Palace, where you piece together everything you find to come up with elaborate conclusions and move the story forward. Elements like these remind me of why I loved Crimes and Punishment in the first place how it portrays Sherlock Holmes. He's an observer and deep thinker, deducing people by mere glances and finding what ordinary people glance over. A shoe print, roughly size 11. Don't you need a tape measure like the original Holmes? Though The Awakened handles deductions more linearly. Unlike Crimes and Punishment, there are no multiple conclusions to make or chances of getting any of them wrong. Still, the game's linearity is dealt with pretty well. There are also difficulty levels that dictate how these elements are presented. The first two keep the modifiers on or off, while Mycroft, which I chose for this playthrough, allows you to customize them to your whim. I won't go too deep into them, but I like the third option for allowing me to set my own parameters. Besides investigation, there are a few other additions. There will be times where you have to go into your archives and research a certain topic. Playing alongside the original, I am thankful they opted for this since it helps the story flow more smoothly. There are a couple of puzzle sections and minigames, but I don't want to go into them too much since they're worth discussing in the spoilers. Just know that there are only a few, but serve as great diversions from all the deducing. Finally, there's customization. As you progress through the game, you can unlock clothing for both Holmes and Watson by finding clues. Your progress is tracked with the clue counter. Holmes' options include anything from his coat and hat, makeup, eyeglasses, and facial hair. Though, for Watson, you can only change his hat and suit. I did not delve into it too much, but the number of options is fun for those who like to dress their character up. Along with those are some game art with HP Lovecraft quotes and other items. It really encourages replayability for those who care about 100%ing the game. My one bit of critique isn't a complaint, but rather advice, and it concerns the pin evidence mechanic. You pin a piece of evidence to see it outside the journal. It's helpful when looking around, but playing through it again made me realize it is essential. There are pieces of evidence you cannot investigate further unless you pin it. 
I thought this affected the confrontation mechanic for a while, but after some testing, I could say it doesn't. The little pin icon above highlights the pieces of evidence that require pinning. The tutorials hint at this, but not clearly. So, some advice going in is always to check the journal. If there are any pin icons above any evidence, you need to pin them. Now, for the story, or stories in this case. Without spoilers, both the original and the remake head toward the same ending, but their paths drastically differ. The original is... somewhat of a grounded experience, with only hints of supernatural powers. Yet, it also has these moments of campiness alongside the horror elements. It's hard to pin down whether it's supposed to be a true Sherlock Holmes mystery or a parody. That's not to say it's terrible. Far from it. The campiness gives off this weird charm when followed up with horror elements. The remake is more of a Lovecraftian tale in comparison, with the supernatural choosing not to hide from the intelligent detective. It also has more character development between Holmes and Watson, since this is very early in their detective careers, unlike the original, which features a more veteran duo. Their developing friendship is also vital to the story, since it helps Holmes with the obstacles and revelations ahead. It's not a power-friendship dynamic, but it makes for a compelling narrative. Both stories are fantastic, though I would suggest playing the remake first because it is a more digestible experience. To explain why means going into spoilers, where I will go more in depth to contrast the stories and puzzles between each iteration. So, if you do not want spoilers, click off the video now and check the games out. Or you could go to the timestamp here to see my conclusion. We're good? Okay. So. Like I said before, both stories are on drastically different paths, but are heading towards the same destination. Let's take the beginning of both, for example. The original starts with... Holmes! Help me! Do not fight the calling! Did they forget to add in reverb effects? What's with Watson's broken animations here? Pushing past that, the game really begins with Holmes' usual problem. He hates having nothing to do because his mind craves a challenge. How does he cure these mundane blues? In the original, he just buys books on pirates and sea fauna. Also, one of the Baker Street Irregulars, Holmes' informants, gives him a copy of The Strand, detailing an astronomical event, the disappearance of a Swedish royal's bodyguard, weird squid catches, and more. Undoubtedly, the joke about butchers will have some importance down the line. Meanwhile, in the remake, Holmes is putting together a diagram that links burglaries in London, and needs the latest edition of the Strand to tie it all together. Unfortunately, Watson threw it out in the trash outside because it was dirty up. Holmes finds where it is, along with a prick of a poisonous cactus inside, leading Holmes to believe that Barnes is part of an intricate plot to assassinate him. Investigating the bookshop and the flower store across the street, reveals it all to be a complex misunderstanding. Hmm. I, uh, think perhaps I have been chasing shadows. Hey, cheer up, Holmes. Both of these are healthier than controlling your mind with cocaine injections or nicotine patches. In both instances, though, Watson has the solution. One of his patients, Captain Stenwick, has reported his servant missing. This servant, whose name varies, is from Maori, Australia unable to speak English, and never leaves the premise in fear of the outside London world. The police won't investigate because disappearances are not their concern, even though there have been multiple disappearances throughout the country. Wow, Scotland Yard is incompetent. So, how do these play out? In the original, Holmes finds a few clues, but nothing more important than that Stenwick forces his servant to be a minimalist. The investigation itself is very minimal, but enough to determine that the servant is, in fact, kidnapped, having been knocked out by an opiate in the brazier. Holmes reports his findings to Stenwick, but not before riffing on him for his employment strategies. Mr. Stenwick, I wish my news were your servant simply left your employment voluntarily for the service of a more honest man. Unfortunately, I don't have that pleasure. He examines the evidence of Baker Street, while well, Watson gets a book on Maori culture and information from the Baker Street Irregular. In the remake, Holmes conducts a full investigation, 
finding various clues, and using Stenwick's information to reconstruct the crime scene, coming to the same conclusion. However, this feels much more satisfying, because you're actually figuring the events out, rather than just taking a few items and listening to Holmes' take on things. When informing Stenwick, he riffs all over us instead. I'm not interested in the how, the why, or the who. I am only interested in recovering my investment. Spare me the claptrap, boy, and go and fetch my servant. You can choose how to respond to it, but I prefer silence. Better to be stoic. Holmes and Watson get the key to the alleyway and find a pouch with the name Roy Salsby on it and a couple of other items to prove that the man who kidnapped the servant is a sailor. Holmes then points out the strand paper, which details an accident at the port. Alright, so both instances lead to the port. All good, right? Almost. In the original, there are times where you must type in answers based on the clues you have found. It is a good test of your attention, so... Let's type in Port of London. Your intentions are good, my dear Watson, but you have missed everything of importance. Uh... Port? Yes, Watson. There is little room for doubt. Paradoxical, I know. By the way, you head to the port. In the original, you find a pub where a barman directs you to Harper, who will tell you more about what you need to know. You also meet a drunken man waiting on his wooden hand and has gotten into... A very uncomfortable encounter with a giant worm. The man's delivery, however, is like someone imitating cartoon drunkenness, not actual drunkenness. Yes, Grams, is what it was. A sudden attack in the middle of the night. I forgot for a sec that this is supposed to be a horror mystery. They head to Harper's, but it's currently unoccupied. Instead, a Nepalese woman and her son are right next door. Holmes is able to translate, despite her rush dialogue. It kind of feels like she's on speed. In any case, the two are lamenting for the eldest son, who has disappeared since being hired by a man with a silver eye. He gave the family a pendant that looks silver, but is actually fake. Exploring the docks further, the duo finds a guy who's either very sick or his audio is just choppy. Maybe both. The delivery man is actually drunk, but not by choice. He claims that some guys jumped him and chugged the drink into him. The beverage itself is brewed with turnips. I didn't think there could be a flavor of alcohol. They find the brewer, who has the package the drunk man has been waiting for. Holmes also questions him about the pendant, which the brewer has seen with another gangster hired by a man with a red cap. He says they went to Warehouse 12 and have never been seen since. With that info, Holmes gives the parcel and receives the drunk man's hook. Also, bring up the description of the silver-eyed man, and the barman tells you that it is Dirty Summers. His name says it all. He's been recruiting people in the bar's private room behind the curtain, the only thing there being symbols carved into the table. The remake side of the story tells that Holmes and Watson find Roy Salsby, who turns out to be the customs officer for the port, and, by observation, a corrupt one. He admits that Holmes isn't the first to ask about missing persons, which includes the Nepalese family who hung missing person posters all over. This time, though, the mom's not here because she inhaled so much smoke from the dock accident that she had to go to a doctor. The kid's alone, with no one to care for him. How has he not been removed by an adoption agency yet? The kid gives us the information about his missing brother and the man with the silver eye so we can ascertain Dirty Summer's true identity from the now barmaid hiding a pregnancy. Confronting Salsby with aiding and abetting forces him to admit to letting Summers do his job. He emptied a warehouse to be used, marked by a red X on the door. He also says that Summers has been hanging around the bar a lot, and you can confront the barmaid with this fact, especially with... Should the police come knocking, you'll be the one going away. And none of us wish to see you raise a child behind bars. How can someone sound so cold, yet also so genuine at the same time? By the way, we get in the back and find out about Summers hiring people to move cargo into Warehouse 12. So, how do we get in? The original is about combining the hook with the rope and using it to open a latch on the other side of the door. In the remake, it's a pretty straightforward block-picking minigame. 
Either way, you are in. In the warehouse are boxes that may or may not give clues about their cargo, depending on which game you are playing, but also a secret passage either opened by force or by finding a crank. You descend the dark depths in the original and meet Dark Silhouette Watson. You also solve a puzzle to open the door by pressing the buttons with symbols corresponding to the ones you found on the table. In the remake, you descend into... This. Cthulhu's Puzzle Extravaganza, where the solutions can be anything from chucking yourself into the abyss, finding a button to open a door, or throwing yourself into the belly of a worm just to get to a lower portion of the level and assembling a floating set of platforms that move when you do. Joking aside, I actually like these Cthulhu puzzles. They are telling you to solve them in the most unorthodox ways while using Holmes' current abilities, and they're a great diversion from the more intricate investigations. Either game sends you to... This guy. In the original, he's a dark silhouette and not... What a horror. Oh. I just got reminded that this is a horror mystery. Both reveal that the corpse is Amos Colby, a detective for the Northwood Agency of Boston, Massachusetts. It looks like he's been ritualistically sacrificed while trying to interfere with the smuggling ring here. It also seems like the hostages have been drugged by the opiate found in Stanley's shack, used to indoctrinate instead, and is seen by the symbols and phrases on the wall. The drugs do have a reference to an A device. Colby seems to have left clues before his death in the form of a cross in a box and a statuette of Cthulhu beside his corpse. Getting the info we need, we... Wait, did Holmes just grow a beard in the remake after one Cthulhu vision? Oh well, it actually looks better than his plain look. Anyways, they... Watch eels come out of Colby. They show more in the original, but... I'm just questioning how something like this is in the same game as this. Oh, thank you, sir. I could kiss you. Back at Baker Street, Holmes looks up the Black Gate device in the archives and discovers it is a psychological institute in Switzerland. It actually feels good to look this up. Unlike the original, which makes you backtrack, Try to find a customs officer who isn't there, and track footprints that I found while trying to find the customs officer! We just find the Black Edelweiss logo! After receiving correspondence from Mycroft about Northwood, and a translation of some symbols we found copied in the underground cave, we can finally type in Switzerland. That was frustrating. And I'm glad this portion is absent in the remake. Anyways, up to Switzerland. Holmes says he won't be joining Watson in either scenario because he'll be pursuing other leads, but trust Watson to find the info they need from the Institute. Watson arrives by... Meh. Or incredible build-up to an insane asylum. I'm already hyped. Arriving, Watson is greeted by the facility's director, Dr. Gygax, whose sex depends on the virgin you play. Before you can talk further, you see... Old says Amos Colby. Good morning, I am Amos Colby from the Northwood Agency of Boston, Massachusetts. Everyone, your attention please. Guten day. Yes, hi. Hello. The name's Amos Colby, Northwood Detective Agency, Boston. Both these scenes really do well to juxtapose the two versions of disguised Holmes. You could tell that the younger detective is struggling to keep up the fake accent and playing up his part way too much. Either way, disguised Holmes is taken away into a room and either has to switch the injection with tranquilizer for water while the other patient is being sedated, even though they can clearly see you doing this, or just get ejected. Now we're in. The original has Holmes going through a solo sneaky mission, first getting out of his cell by doing this lockpicking minigame. In theory, this should be easy. There are numbers in the middle labeled 1 through 10, and you have to separate them into slots to assemble them from least to greatest. In practice, however, the topmost slots are very selective in what you can put in after the first number, while the ones near the center allow any combination of ordered numbers. The problem is that 
there's no clear indication of what you can do with the top or bottom most numbers. The first one is easy enough, but the second one? My first time playing this, I had to look up a guide because I had been at it for an hour and couldn't handle it anymore. I solved it in the second playthrough without remembering much and was amazed. Man, I have to take a minute to talk about this because this is probably the hardest lockpicking mini game I have ever encountered. I played a lot of Bethesda RPGs with lockpicking mechanics. I have played Thief Simulator, which has two or three types of lockpicking, and none of them compared to this. It is so unique, yet so frustrating at the same time. Thankfully, there are only two of these. Anyways, we get past that first one and do all sorts of sabotage while moving through the facility. Help a patient named Maurizio escape, clear the upstairs lobby, and grab a nurse's disguise. Knock out a nurse with a blow dart. I would take more pipes, but Holmes says they're too heavy. He then proceeds to pick up and carry an entire anvil. Beat a patient, pink crystal meth. Reunite a girl named Gerda with her doll Heidi so we can get the key to an office and grab some items, including the key to the aviary. Why? So we can create a distraction with birds that this prisoner here has been starving. I want them to fly! Fly out! Fly out! <laughs> I love this man's enthusiasm. Let's grant his wish. <laughs> man, this guy is happy to see Chaos Reign. So, with the nurses distracted, Methhead here tells us that there have been foreigners of all kinds taken to a downstairs area. His entrance just across from us. The odd thing is that when they come out, they speak the same language and phrase repeatedly. The gate is a double door where one handle opens the respective door but closes the other. We can take an entire tray cart, being carried along with the anvil. Seriously, Holmes, you are in denial of your strength. Assemble those and one of the objects from the Avery's keeper's office to ready one of the levers. Good start, but we're missing something. The kitchen may have answers, but it's occupied. The answer? Assemble a smoke bomb! Which you can only do after examining this table. There's no good reason to, but you have to. After that, though, the bomb is easy. Fire! Fire! I guess D&D people label Holmes chaotic neutral for a reason. In the kitchen, you find trussel and instructions for the elevator in Gygax's office. With the trussel, you can open the way into the... dungeon. Let's get back to the remake. There are many similar events. Knocking out the guard, but it's a shaky minigame. Meeting Gerda and Maurizio, get Heidi back, even the nurse's disguise, which gets rid of Holmes's beard somehow. However, a few of the character roles have changed. For example, Maurizio now thinks he's... I am the Great Napoleon! Yep, none other than the Great Dynamite himself. Napoleon Bonaparte? Oh wait, Bonaparte. Never mind. Upon further investigating where the hostages are unloaded, the door into the downstairs area, or Hell's Door as Gerda calls it, is locked behind a fake wall requiring a special key. Gerda may know more, so we head back in. Take your little mouth, Gerda. You've said enough already. Uh... She won't speak no more. Now it's only Heidi. Heidi has more facial expressions than the rest of the cast. That must be terrifying to stiff face Holmes. Confront Heidi and find out that the key to the door is in Gygax's office. Watson can get it, but we need a distraction to talk to him. That's where Napoleon comes in. Your freedom awaits. I am coming, Josephine. That is the only other expression Holmes will ever make. This gives us the window to brief Watson and play as him. We meet with Gygax and, honestly, she's much more of a developed character than in the original. She actually has a philosophy behind her work. A broken mind can never be truly healed. Ah, I see. So, what exactly do you do here? It is simple. If you cannot fix a person's nature, you must force them to forget it. A villain doing evil for evil's sake is one thing. But one that justifies their own actions as right is one tier scarier. The scariest is a competent villain, which she is, but we'll undo that. We don't see the key, so we need a way to get her out of her office. And before you ask, no, we don't free the birds. 
Instead, we look up a patient Gygax mentioned during the meeting called Wolf. She seems to be examining his ability to recall memories and writing skills. We meet him in person, and he can't remember anything beyond 15 seconds of a conversation. Upon further examination, we discover that Gygax has been doing extensive surgeries and treatments that affect his ability to remember... Wait. Chemical burns on the hands? As Holmes, we discover a note from the previous director about suffering chemical burns while interviewing Gerda and complaining to Gygax about her unethical work. That means... Oh, no. Okay, here's the plan. While the former director's memory is gone, he can write comprehensively. We tell him to write a letter, as if he has regained his memory, which will get Gygax's attention. But before that, Watson vents. My name is John Watson. I'm a doctor from London, a veteran of Afghanistan, and I wish to be a writer, though deep down I fear I lack the talent. And presently I'm risking my life to help my brilliant detective flatmate in the pursuit of a cult of kidnappers, even as I fear it may destroy him. I'm tired and hungry, and I have not had a good bath in weeks, and yet despite it all, I... I feel alive. Any more questions? Good heavens, sir. You're as mad as they come. He may just be, Wolf. Deliver the letter and... Unbelievable. Kunz, with me. What is that music bite? It only plays for five seconds, but nothing comes of it. Whatever. Find the key, along with some correspondences about gems being sold in Louisiana, payment from someone named R for experimenting on his chosen ones, and that Gygax is really the only doctor here. She fired the rest and replaced them with nurses. With the key in hand, we head into the kitchen, no smoke bomb required, and send it down a dumb waiter to the lower levels, which Holmes takes to open the secret door. It's safe to say that I am... mixed on how the remake handled this portion of the Institute. The original taps into Sherlock's chaotic side, but it also introduced a frustrating lockpicking minigame. Sure, the remake still has you breaking patients out and satiating their needs, but those feel mild compared to the original. How can you beat freeing frenzied birds in smoke bombs? Let's look back at the original and see. Wolf is here, but he's just a patient. He's recounting math equations to himself and will only talk to someone named Dr. Schwartz. Up ahead, we see a branching path. Let's take the one to Gygax's office. Closed. Tight. Closed. Tight. Closed. Tight. Fine. To the well. Before you ask, yes, this is where the second lockpicking minigame is. Inside, we find a well with... My god, there is a body inside. Huh. I'm glad I, spared one. I guess the butcher joke did have a place in the story. We also see the key to Gygax's office. We find a few correspondences about goods sold in New Orleans from a Mr. A and a key to a classroom. We also see the patient logs, and it turns out Wolf has every mental affliction known to man. Well, in relation to the time period. Also inside is a picture of Schwartz. Everything else is locked, and the spoon won't unlock anything this time. What do we use? A poker you can't find unless you are looking for it or highlighted it. You use it to pry open the drawer and the door. In the drawer are letters about somebody called the Light of Abyss. This is the same Light of Abyss mentioned in the translated poems, and he's apparently the one to enlighten when darkness returns. There are also notes about sales from Swiss banks to ones in New Orleans. Inside the door is another lab with documents that reveal Gygax experimenting with bird and human brains to be able to sing a specific song or chant using phonetics and torture. For the patients who I think we should move on. Finally, in the classroom upstairs, we learn about a unique student who can calculate the exact time of a celestial event related to the one in the Strand article. We can look him up in the archives and he's... well, take a minute to read for yourselves. We also find a fake beard that could be used to complete a Dr. Schwartz disguise. Now we can talk to Wolf. I congratulate you, Wolf. I cannot say the same about your other classmates. I am most unhappy with their behavior, because it seems they have been cheating. Professor Schwartz, you saw them, didn't you? Let's speed things up. Wolf tells us that Gygax has been fiddling with the torches. So must we. Doing so in the correct order opens a secret passage to... an old man. 
who you are means nothing. All that matters is your reverence to the one. This old man is, in fact, the light of abyss, who spouts some stuff about Cthulhu's return and us being his breakfast. This conversation alerts the nurses, so time to escape. Remember what the note in the kitchen said about this. We're in some sort of storage closet and are surrounded. We find a prisoner with us who is, in fact... M Moriarty! Moriarty, my worst enemy and a man who was presumed dead. That's right. He is the mysterious patient, but he is mentally absent. Here is where Holmes pulls off the highest IQ play I've ever seen a character do. This man who is speaking to two others, a man of great intellect and ability, who is approaching and is even now right behind that door. You know him well, Professor. He is... Sherlock Holmes. No other character has pulled a stunt like this. At least not to my knowledge. Now we get our Colby disguise back and get caught by Watson. First of all, my friend, you should know that you have been dealing with two famous professionals. Your deceit has failed, and you should know that it is impossible to confound us. Who are you, and why have you come here? Surprise! Meanwhile, the remake condenses all of this beyond Hell's Door. The classroom is here, but more brutal, and has a recording we could play. Beyond that, Everything else is the same, even the experiments on birds. The well is even here, body parts at all. The light of abyss is even here, but his encounter is more. <laughs> Trippy. This makes me question the motives here. They seemingly want to recruit Holmes, or at least drive him insane. Why? They clearly see him as a threat, but let him keep on if that means he will fall for their temptations eventually. Whatever the case, Light of Abyss teleports, I guess, and we make our way out into Gygax's office via elevator. Watson is there, but female Gygax is stabbed to death. The only clue we have to her killer is the Heidi doll. Gerda for a sequel? Who knows? But you know what? I like how the latter portion is handled here. It lets you experience the horrors conducted here, rather than make you work to see them. It's nice. But I prefer the chaos I performed in the original, especially with what we made Moriarty do. We know that, in both cases, we have to make our way to New Orleans and find this A person. In the original... Hercule! Hercule! Where are you? Oh, here you are. Naughty boy, come along now. Madame Poirot. Hercule and Sherlock? The dream crossover? Well, kind of. Getting Hercule Poirot and Sherlock Holmes in the same room is great. And it makes sense when you realize that Agatha Christie was a fan. Though, I had hoped to see them solve crimes together. Welcome to sunny New Orleans. We take a trip to the bank and find an auction for the stones is taking place. The same one pension in Gygax's letters. The guard won't give us information, so we give him a small bribe. He tells us that Champagne, an old man living by the end of the docks, can help us. He doesn't either. I would help you out, but my poor brains like the train with no coal. Bribe. Making my daddy come to me true. He tells us that a butler has been trading in some jewels on behalf of someone named Arneson, who lives in the French Quarter. He also spotted a ship coming in the middle of the night to meet with other smaller boats from the swamp. So, it's off to the French Quarter we... Holmes, our bag! Thief! Stop! Thief! I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but this is the silliest chase music I've ever heard. This isn't even chase music. This is dance music. Just listen to it. There he is. Tell me with a straight face that you wouldn't let this music play to swing your partner round and round. This caught me off guard among all the other campy things in this game. 
It was probably because I had just gotten out of the insane asylum, but it genuinely surprised me because this is supposed to be a horror game, yet this starts playing. I am not dissing this track or chase at all. Far from it. It's my favorite in all of the game, and I genuinely hope whoever composed and implemented this got a raise or a promotion. This is genuine gold. The chase itself is okay, making our way from the docks to the factory until we get stopped by the Looney Tunes Sheriff. He tells us to leave on the next ship by tomorrow, or there will be trouble. Oh, and one more thing. Without proper papers, you're nothing more than outlaws here in New Orleans. And outlaws end up as gator bait in my parish. Real gators or Looney Tunes ones? But wait, that's the bank guard on this right. No wait, it isn't. Probably his brother and his grandpa with them. A woman looks down on the conversation, and that's when we can finally go to the French Quarter. Meanwhile, no, we don't go through a chase with silly music in the remake. We should, though. Instead, we find a way to sneak into the auction by disguising Watson as one of its participants who drank himself to sleep. Watson finds some vital information on what precisely these stones are, and the contributors, including E. Arneson. Then, we meet the sheriff, whose name is... Grub. I'm sure that's a common name. But it contrasts with how much better his personality is. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Think careful now, because Frank Barnaby only owes us cash. But fraud? Impersonation? That's weasel behavior. And you know what we do to weasels around these parts. Feed them to the gators. I legitimately feel like this guy would feed Watson to actual gators. He sees right through the disguise and coldly threatens us for cash. The remake really does the villains more justice than in the original. We return to our boat to find our luggage thrown into the river by the boatman. Rude. Luckily, a girl named Lucy is there and generously gives Watson a place to change in her room called the Nymph of Louisiana. Lucy points us out to Champagne, who is now a female hermit. Progressive. She points us to the French Quarter, and we figure out Arneson may be involved. Quick disclaimer for the upcoming French Quarter. Both have overlapping story elements, though they may happen in a different order. Since a lot of what I say here will apply for both, I'll present the original's footage, but bring up the remake if absolutely needed. Outside the mansion, we meet Eula, whose little brother Davy serves Arneson. Neither has been seen for five days, and she's worried. She also says that Davy is very smart, but mute, so we won't be able to hear him. We enter the stable, and find a horse dying of thirst. We can give it something to drink, and your reward is a hammer it's been sitting on. Don't forget the nails, too. We discover the gardener is dead, but no one else is in sight. We investigate the house, top to bottom, inside and out. Well, not entirely, because access to the docks is blocked by an unusually large mosquito horde. Plus, this section of the upstairs floor is locked, so we need a key. We can find out that someone, probably a servant, kidnapped Darnison and brought him out in the direction of the river. Davy saw these events and hid himself in one of the rooms we currently can't get into. We can look in Darnison's office and learn that Davy's inability to speak looks more psychological than physical. Oh, and he's not just smart. He's a prodigy. Arneson actually acts like a parent to this kid. It's awesome. Searching the mansion enough will reveal a combination lock. The only clue to it may be this clock puzzle. The answer to each red number is how many numbers can each bold number be divided by. For example, 1 times 1 means only one number, 1 times 4 and 2 times 2 means only two numbers go into 4, and so on. This gives us the key for the upstairs portion we couldn't reach Oh no. Head to the barn, grab the large log, and break the door down before Eula strangles to death. With her is a letter from the sheriff, giving us a final warning to leave. Of course we don't listen. Watson attends to her, leaving us to enter the... trophy room. Exquisite. We find a mechanism for the large painting to open a secret door. 
but we must shoot through the eye. We have no gun, and the one in Artisan's safe is unloaded. So, grab a lemon tree from outside, place it on the floor tile, and head downstairs to find- What the- Watson? Holmes, she is still in shock. I must stay with her. We would do best to divide our forces and meet up later. Uh... Maybe if I get far enough, he'll just dis- and he's no clipping through the door. Perhaps he won't follow me through the bounds of the trophy room. Nope, he still does. I checked. The game still registers his player model next to Eula, even though he is now following me. Dark Silhouette Watson evolved into Dark Mage Watson. He's healing Eula from a far distance while staying with us. I don't know whether to find this impressive or scary. I'm gonna make a backup save, just in case. We find a metal rod that we can push into the eye socket. Inside, we find correspondences to Northwood Agency, who Arneson hired to investigate Ashmat, the butler, confirming his actions have been independent of Arneson's commands. We also see a picture of the blonde who is, in fact, Lucy. Another photo of her is hidden inside a goat's head whose gaze pierces my soul. We need to talk to Watson and hope talking to him here doesn't break the game. Thankfully, it doesn't. But Eula... If you think that's the extent of Watson's powers, just wait. We convince Eula to talk to Davy and open the door. Is... Davy okay? He's gritting his teeth and holding a very uncomfortable stare. Is that part of his condition, or maybe what happened during the attack? Anyways, he gives us the information on a piece of paper Ashmat took from him, and it contains... numbers that we can't make sense of. At least not yet. In the remake, Davy writes out Ashmat being the murderer, as well as a poem that Artisan intercepted meant for Ashmat. We can check out Ashmat's room, and some documents on the table, and in a secret compartment under the bed. You need them because they detail how to get through a later section of the level. Also, the game will not let you leave without these items, even though they do not contribute to the remake's mind palace. With you all and Davy safe, we need to explore the dock area, but first, cover yourself with lemon juice because a book about insects told you to. If this trick actually works, why waste money on bug repellent? We find evidence that Arneson put up a fight, but not without the cost of his own right hand, which is mysteriously missing. Wherever Ashmat took him, it's in the direction of the river. You'd think that's it, but no. First we have to assemble a bouquet to give to Lucy when we meet her. The Looney Tunes sheriff comes in and chases us away with Looney Tunes guns. At least that's what they sound like. We meet the original Lucy, who sounds like a southern belle. He is such a kind man, and had promised we would be married this autumn. Either version tells us that Arneson had some interest in the swamp, which is probably where Ashman took him. We need champagne to get a boat. In the remake, she gives it to us with a bottle of champagne we found at Arneson's place, along with a gun. Simple. In the original, however, his favorite drink will only give us a lantern and some planks. But we need those planks for a reason, to go back to the French Quarter. Won't the sheriff be waiting for you guys? Well, it doesn't matter because we need to get Arneson's ring, which Lucy says will open the cabinet in his secret office and get the money to buy a boat. The hand itself? In the possession of carnivorous raccoons. Get ham from the kitchen and use it to find where the raccoon's den is. Then we can make a ladder out of the planks with the hammer and nails to find... I am never going to see raccoons the same way again. There is a sub puzzle in the remake, but thankfully less gruesome. Unless that carrot is actually a finger. Let's just take the ring and acquire the money and gun in the case. Well, what did you know it? The sheriff was waiting. Luckily our ladder saves us. Uh, guys, that's the wrong way. Guys, with the money, Champagne gives us a boat, and we head out into the swamp. The remake sees Grub chase you in, but gives up thinking you're goners. Remember the instructions, which differ between iterations, and you'll be fine. Even with default lighting, the swamp looks pretty spooky in the remake. 
and it even introduces odd noises and tribal drums to heighten the tension. What was that, Holmes? Whatever or whoever it was, we should ready ourselves. Am I hearing drums? Drums in the bayou? The original has this. But what is this horror, Holmes? Where have you taken us? Near the goal, Watson. Near the goal. Also, some gators in both iterations that we need to get past. However, the remake has an achievement for letting yourself get eaten by the gators. And I'm two achievements away from getting 100%. So... <laughs> Worth it. What you should do is shoot down the hanging corpses for the gators to eat so you can pass by. In the original, shooting the corpse allows Stark Mage Watson to let us go through unharmed. You reach the ritual site, and the original... doesn't have much. It has Arneson, a giant Cthulhu statue, which you give the smaller figure to, and get a Necronomicon, and this guy. Bow down and give thanks. You are the food of his new world. <laughs> Riveting. In the remake, you go through an extensive investigation to find a secret passage, which leads into, what else, but another go at Cthulhu's puzzle extravaganza. He even lets you grab the Necronomicon. That's... human skin? Oh. I don't think I want it anymore. Though I will happily take on his challenges. Let's see... there is nothing here. Not even a bridge. Going through the door, there are the platforms we can assemble like last time, but they're transparent. Not even plunging into the abyss does much. Wait, is it possible that... Oh, it's kind of like Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade, only more complex. Neat. This cemented the Cthulhu puzzles for me, just for being this mesh of bizarre yet logical. It's just too bad that there aren't many of them. Our final Cthulhu puzzle is where you have to... Wait, am I reading my own script right? Let yourself get sliced by swinging axes that correspond to the correct symbols. Well, I fed myself the gators for an achievement, so why not? Repeat two more times, and you're home free. Well, at least in the waking world. You play as Watson and find Holmes cowering and confused by what he just saw. This whole experience is taxing him so much that his beard continues to be inconsistent. Watson leaves him to help Arneson, who is traumatized and needs to be sedated. You'll find everything you need in the cave. Holmes goes out to get fresh air, but instead, he talks to the corpse of a crucified man. Phantoms of nothing, we are born to die, filled in the eyes of our eldritch lord. Free my festering soul and let me feel. You can just hear how exposure to the supernatural is warping his sense of reality. This is reminiscent of the Call of Cthulhu story, which is why I say it's more of a Lovecraftian story than a regular Sherlock Holmes mystery. Watson saves Holmes from allowing this man to murder him, and, in both iterations, they get back to Champagne and reunite Arneson with Lucy. A somewhat happy ending for them, but not the end for our detective duo. They head back to London after Holmes's dance craze and get another correspondence from Mycroft. He says male Gygax killed himself, and the stones he's been selling belong to a royal named Archibald Rochester, who supposedly died at sea, but his treasure suddenly came into Gygax's possession years after the event. By process of elimination, Rochester is our perp. Now comes the typing puzzle that you must look up a guide for. There is a way to decipher the code in game, but none of the documents spell it out. Unless you're a cryptographer, just go look up a guide. The numbers only translate to more numbers. You know what? Let's just save here and start with the remakes events and how. Wait. 
I can't make a new save? Maybe I could just overwrite one. What? I can't overwrite anything either. I, I can't save. It all happened after I made this one. Dark Mage Watson really wants me to finish the game so he can absorb Cthulhu's powers. At least that's my deduction. So, you know what? To heck with it. Let's finish this so we can move on to the remake's final moments. We head to Barnes, since he claims to know about ancient and obscure cultures. He's surprised by our discovery and says translating will take time. We head back to Baker Street and get a copy of the Strand from our little informant. It details a giant storm on the western Scottish coast, unlike anything seen before. This does seem to. Wait. It's. that supposed to be a Pink Panther reference? Holmes deduces it may have something to do with the case, so we head to the port and ask our kind barman for sea charts. He allows us in back to look at the ones he has. It's here that the numbers we fairly deciphered are revealed to be coordinates for latitude and longitude. They point to what the barman describes as a lighthouse built on top of a pirate hideaway with Egyptian architecture and is at the storm's center. Let's head to Bards' store! But I clicked on the other icon. The complete translation details a ritual to bring people from every nation to one place and throw them into the sea to wake Cthulhu up from his thousand-year slumber and feed on us. It's hard to tell from his tone whether he's scared or really takes it all as, as he puts it, myth and fancy. They sought nothing less than the end of the world. <laughs> what nonsense! <laughs> This very much relates to the constellation mentioned in the first paper. No time to waste. Let's go! Look, Watson! The light is barely lit! I don't know what this shaking cam is supposed to accomplish, nor the rain sound effects with no rain, other than looking cheap. Holmes! If we do not find a place to land, and soon, I fear they will add our names to those poor souls lost in these seas. Yes, those poor, lost, tea-posing souls. Let's explore. The lighthouse is locked, but there's an iron bar with these scratched-out black sphinxes. There's also a shack with rope and a barrel of water and boat racks, one of which only has an item for later. Finally, there's a set of geysers. We could do well to remember what Magritte's man said before they slit his throat. At first, I didn't know what Holmes meant here and walked around where I could, but Going the wrong direction meant I had to start again from the geysers. Well, remember what the barman said? This island is also a pirate hideout. You had a pirate book since the beginning. And wouldn't you know it? It actually explains what to do. Hold on. Ram? What ram? Oh! How did I not see that until now? You stop at a large rock and move it with the iron bar, finding a cave underneath. Tie the rope to the rock and... Drop down. Holmes is on his own and walks through the cave covered by a terribly pixelated door. There's actually a lot of stories conveyed here in this cave. The pirates seem to have given up, drinking themselves dry or hanging themselves. They died by the dozen since you could find a whole bone pile to make torches from. So, how do we make our way forward? Build a bomb. For real. Then grab a belt from this guy to work a contraption that should not be possible. Aren't these pirates from before the Industrial Revolution? Proceed further and find the captain buried with his treasure. The treasure was poorly concealed after all. Why, even a child could have found it. You brag about your intelligence, but not your ability to carry anvils? You could take the captain's sword and finally get into the lighthouse and its spooping music bit. This doesn't help the moment become more scary. With the door now unlocked, we could grab a bucket of water and put out the braziers blocking our- How clever you are, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, right. Ashmat. Putting out the braziers to the left- Bravo, Holmes! You're giving me away, Watson! Hit the lever with the rope and scare Ashmat away. 
Watson then tells us that he's out of bullets, but his black magic can allow us to take him down by grabbing a piece of wood upstairs and using blood to draw the Cthulhu symbol, which sends Ashman into a seizure, and he dies. Thanks, Dark Mage Watson! We head upstairs and face Dirty Summers while Watson fights the no-clipping Indian. LEGENDARY FIGHT! Summer says that we won't be able to get up to the top because his Indian companion hid the key. We would have gotten the answer, but Watson kills him before Summers can talk. Do you want to absorb Cthulhu's powers or not? We can't get the key until we get to the top because we have to make a guess. Where else? Watson cuts into the stomach and finally we face Rochester. He summons me to join the Light of Abyss. Join us, Holmes, and you will be part of the dream! He refuses to stand down, and the sacrifices have broken out of their T-pose to sacrifice themselves. How do we stop this? How can we save the world? Switching out bottles to activate the lighthouse. That was... surprisingly easy. Before getting to the ending, Dark Mage Watson finally lets us leave the original and get to the remake. We meet Mycroft back in London, who scolds Holmes and Watson for their interference in the asylum. Why? That place is a private institution conducting experiments on its patients. What stakes did you have in it? Did you have deals with Gygax or something? Did Gygax have contracts with the Swiss government? You told us we did good in the original. What changed? Regardless, Mycroft leaves, and Holmes stays behind to contemplate the events abroad. We play as Watson and do the same stuff. Get the strand, learn about the storm, give the book to Barnes. Instead of giving up on a cryptic number sequence, though, we look up a royal family using one of Ashman's poems to find out their lighthouse business. With Barnes's translation of the book, we can determine what the cultists will do next. Barnes wants to keep and translate the book more, but we can take it away from him. Though I am one achievement from joining the 8%. Have fun, Barnes. Mycroft pulls us aside and gives us the information on Rochester and a side quest. Okay, I need to address this. There is day one DLC for this game that includes new costumes and side quests that are not in the game for $13. I never bought it, and Mycroft's is the only side quest I found. I saw a few other reviews on Steam saying there are a few others in the base game. But I scoured the levels and thought the posters left by the Nepalese family were a side quest. What we are given is good and hints at an obvious villain, but this had me debating the moral implications. I still think they could have just added the DLC and bumped up the price, especially if they think the quests complement the primary investigation. However, Frogwares is a company based in Ukraine, a country under extraordinary wartime distress. So, I'm willing to give them a pass since I don't have the whole picture of what made them make this decision. Side quest over, we head back and find Holmes in a crisis. He thinks he's becoming mad and can't continue the investigation. Watson can try to reassure him, or sarcastically reassure him. Oh, you are undoubtedly mad. And egotistical, irascible, oblivious, infuriating. All right. Self-absorbed, self-righteous, self-congratulatory. Okay and invariably correct. So fear not madness, for it seems to me your greatest strength. Something stirs in the depths, Sherlock. A danger. A darkness only a madman would dare face. Either way, Holmes gets out of his bunk, and we make it to the final chapter. Now this is how you build up a final level. And look, there's even rain, and not just sound effects. Again, the door is locked, and there is an underground cavern, but no pirate history to help us this time. Instead, we find Ashman, who seemingly killed himself in a fit of insanity. Investigate the scene, and find the medallion that opens the cave door. The cave itself looks more like an altar to Cthulhu, telling a history of an encounter with fish people. It's pretty easy to figure out, so I won't go too much into it. Just know that it opens more secret passages, and the duo are separated from it. You go through the cave, with... Cthulhu decorations, and Holmes starts screaming for help. Follow the echoes and find Holmes. The whirlwind. 
The stars are so distant. Uh, the sun inverts. The earth it becomes transparent. Nothing is everything. We are so small, inconsequential, a shadow in the dark. Yep, he's definitely losing it. Watson insists on returning home, but Holmes keeps going since they've come too far. Heading up, we find... Crystals and beams. And it seems to now brainwash hostages are drawn to them. How did this change from grounded Victorian era to sci-fi? Some documents reveal that these crystals can be destroyed with an obsidian blade, which you can find on the table. First, point the two beams at the crystal, then break it with the shard. Now we can head upstairs. We beat 30 summers here, and it doesn't last very long. Watson! Honestly, having the no-clipping Indian would have helped this scene. We finally get to the entrance to the lighthouse. Before heading up, we need a plan. In the next room is a blueprint that shows the cultists have crystals and beams everywhere on the tower's top to ensure the brainwashed victims don't throw themselves off. That also means we can use what we learned about breaking crystals. With our plan in action, the duo heads up. Holmes goes to distract Rochester in conversation. We've stood here before, Mr. Holmes. Another you, another me. Many years ago. I wonder what will happen this time. Wait, what? You are standing right here, Holmes, as you always do. This is not mentioned by Rochester in the original. Our informants did not lie. What was it that Barnes told Watson? Entity of ocean or time. No way. Is this remake secretly a sequel to the original? That makes so much sense. It's why Cthulhu is driving you crazy. You stopped him before in a different timeline. How many times you stop him doesn't matter since he seems to not be bound by the customary laws of the universe. It's why he's going after a young and more impressionable Holmes instead of an older and wiser one. Rochester knows that he's failed before, and Cthulhu can move on to another timeline or further back in time to try all this again. The cycle repeats, old becomes new, and we remain pawns in the hands of a god! Or maybe they're making fun of video game remakes. Both explanations are applicable. For the puzzle itself, Watson is moving through the crowd, aiming the beams at crystals he can currently get to, and breaking them. The music and chanting make it sound like time is of the essence, but it's not. No need to rush. There are quick time events, but they're easy unless you have really slow reaction times. There is one portion here where you have to replace a crystal of a non-functioning beam with a crystal from a broken off one, but it requires clicking on both for the action to be available. Besides that, it's all smooth sailing. What is more pertinent is your conversation with Rochester. Say one wrong thing, he falls in, and the apocalypse begins. You have to be honest, which is destroying Holmes. For the longest time, Holmes has made his assumptions on what is probable, what can be grasped through observation and natural law. But as Rochester here states, When you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth! It's part of Holmes's weakness, as Watson says after the misunderstanding with Barnes. No? Well, only that you have a remarkable faculty for deduction and pattern recognition. And that perhaps, if ill-applied... I see things that are not there. Holmes is used to deducing and finding patterns, making sense of the world around him, and seeing things as they should be. Yet, when encountering the most improbable, he tries to understand it with what was not there. Yet, the unimaginable is what he has to accept. It's almost painful to watch Holmes go through this, but the distraction pays off. Yeah! No! Both games end similarly. Rochester throws himself into the giant wave, but Cthulhu is stopped. Holmes insists that the events of their adventure must never see the light of day, and thus, The Awakened comes to a close. On my first playthrough of 2008's The Awakened, 
I struggled with much of the puzzle solving, but either got through it or looked up a guide, much like when playing adventure games in my younger years. Back then, I was more excited to play stealth or action RPGs. I appreciated them more because I looked through the documents and figured out how they worked. It's not that I don't like being challenged, but the puzzles in classic adventures like these occasionally feel haphazard, and I suspect that is partially why the genre fell more into the hands of indie developers. Despite my gripes with the original, I liked both iterations of Sherlock Holmes The Awakening, and highly recommend them. The remake does make substantial improvements over the original, especially with more sensible story directions, cutting out the fluff, and the gameplay overall is a much better balance of challenge and fairness. However, the original's blend of campiness and horror, and some of the glitches during my second playthrough brought a distinctive charm that I won't forget for a long time. Still, I'm glad that Frogwares didn't just paint a fresh coat over the original, but crafted a new experience that I enjoyed from beginning to end, and hope they continue to build on. Judging by the hints I've seen, it seems they already have plans to do so. Thanks for watching this video. It's the first one I have made, and if this takes off, there will be more to come. There are a few people I want to thank before finishing here. First are those who encouraged me to make this video my script editor, and everyone who knows me in real life who came to view this video. I don't know how to put into words how much this means to me. Now, what is the future of this channel? Well, I'm not finished talking about the Awakened remake. Not just yet. I will be scripting an analysis video on an exciting theme I found while playing. If you want to catch it when it comes out, click the follow button to avoid missing it. Also, press the like button if you enjoyed the video, and feel free to comment below on which iteration of The Awakened you like best, or some other similarities and differences I may have missed. For those sticking around, welcome aboard, and I'll see you in the next video.